All right, I have a, I'll, I'll I have a sore, th sore throat, so I apologize if I'm not uh, projecting quite enough. So, um, so I'm giving two lectures on quantum error correction. Uh, today is going to be a um, very basic introduction. I'm going to tell you simple things about spin a half systems and Stern Gerlach measurements that you completely know, but I might use this in a quick review at the beginning, slightly different language um, uh, based on quantum information ideas to describe those ideas, and then uh, explain to you what the quantum error correction problem is, and uh, give some uh, very simple examples. And in the second lecture, um, I'm going to tell you about the first successful quantum error correction experiment that actually made things better instead of worse. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we're looking, uh, this is a whiteboard in the Yale Quantum Institute and looking out that window and just uh, a block away from there is uh, the grave of J.W. Gibbs, uh, someone who knew about entropy and uh, so it's kind of, uh, uh, nice to be thinking about uh, him as we think about quantum entropy. So, a uh, quick review of uh, simple basics. Uh, quantum information is stored in physical states of a quantum system. It can be all kinds of possible uh, different systems are used. I think we'll hear about ions uh, at this conference. I'm going to be uh, talking about superconducting circuits and microwave photons uh, tomorrow. And so information is physical and it's carried by physical systems. Quantum information is paradoxical. Uh, you could ask, is it quantum information carried by waves or particles? Of course, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, is quantum information analog or digital? Yes. Uh, obviously, it's digital because I represent a, a bit, a thing that has two states, zero and one, by, let's say, the energy levels of an atom, and, and I pick the two lowest, and, and because the transition frequencies <laughs> to the others are far away, maybe I can ignore them. And if I ever measure the energy, I'll always get one of the energy eigenvalues. I'll always get a discrete result. Uh, I can call the ground state zero or G or since it's a two-level system, I could think of it as a fake spin a half. Uh, and I, or I could measure energy uh, corresponding to state one, but I always get a discrete result. So classic quantum bits are very much like classical bits. When you measure them, you get one classical bit of information. <laughs> And, you know, that was the big surprise to Stern and Gerlach. The first quantum bit was a silver atom coming out of an oven of some random orientation of its magnetic moment. And yet, when they measured the Z component of the magnetic moment with their magnet, they always got the full value plus a half or, or plus minus a half, plus one and minus one, depending on your units. Um, and they never saw anything in between. They always got a digital result. And that was the quantization of spin and big surprise for them. Uh, but quantum information is analog, of course, because you can have coherent superpositions of the two discrete states with, amplit with amplitude and phase that define latitude and longitude on what's called the Bloch sphere. And it takes an infinite number of classical bits to specify these real numbers that tell you where you are on the sphere. So that's like an analog computer. And you could imagine that errors which develop, which we have to fix, are going to be analog. They're going to be continuous. You could just, like the, the, the arrow could move to a slightly different direction continuously. Uh, and since, uh, so we're going to, I'll sometimes call this a spin, even though it may have nothing to do with electron spin. It just means 
there's a Hilbert space of uh, two states, and I can take superpositions, and those superpositions can be defined by an arrow, which looks very much like the magnetic moment of a spin a half electron pointing in some direction, but it's not. It's, it's two levels of something, an oscillating electric circuit of a Josen junction or a energy levels of an ion not, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with real spin. But the mathematics of transitions and rotations and so forth from spin all, all apply. Okay, so, um, so quantum bits are like classical bits. When you measure them, you get one classical bit of information, but they're more like analog in the sense that they can be many different superposition states. Another way to say it that maybe you haven't thought about before is if I have a classical bit, it's usually represented by a switch being open or closed, on or off, a transistor on or off. And, uh, you know, you can represent zero and one as a switch open and closed or closed and open. Those are your two choices of codes. And those are the only two choices. In a, in a quantum system, you have an infinite number of possible encodings, which you're used to thinking of as quantization axes. So uh, usually in all discussions of quantum information processing, there are two people. One is named Alice, one is named Bob. Sometimes there's an eavesdropper named Eve. So Alice might prepare a quantum bit using this encoding this quantization axis, and she might prepare, uh, I'm going to use uh, capital X, Y, and Z for, uh, for the Pauli matrices instead of sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, just to save ink. Um, she might prepare Z as plus one or minus one. Uh, and Bob, uh, she might send it to Bob, and Bob might make a measurement using what he thinks is the correct quantization axis, which might be tilted at an angle theta. Or equivalently, he might be using the same quantization axis, but there was an error in the transmission which rotated the direction of the qubit on the block sphere by an angle theta. So if Alice gives Bob z is plus one, and Bob measures, he'll measure z prime, and just like in the stern garlic experiment, if you ask, is the spin pointing on this axis, the answer is always yes. It's either fully aligned or fully anti-aligned with whatever axis you choose. So Bob is going to measure that it's z prime is plus 1 with probability uh, cosine squared theta over 2, because that's how you uh, represent the, with these half-angle formulas, the amplitudes on the block sphere. And um, he'll measure z prime as minus 1 with probability sine squared theta over 2. So Bob is always going to find, no matter what encoding or quantization axis he uses, that his spin is aligned, or the spin is aligned in that direction. So after the measurement, let's say he got plus 1, because that's the most likely thing for small angles. The spin is in a new state, right? It's pointing this way. There's a back action of the measurement which has changed the state of the system. And Bob did not see it happen, right? Bob has no way of knowing that it happened. He just measured this and it came out plus one. If he measured it again, he'd get exactly the same result. Over and over again, it's repeatable if it's a quantum non-demolition measurement. So back action is invisible to the person that causes it, and uh, he thinks, oh, Alice sent me a z prime is plus one. Or in those cases where it came out minus one, you say, oh, Alice must have sent me a z prime is minus one. And he can't tell that his active measurement has changed that. Well, that's going to be a problem when it comes to doing quantum error correction, as we'll see. 
So if you think about the number of states that are exponentially large number of states that are available in quantum superpositions of a register of n qubits, it's gigantic. It's, it's uh, doubly exponential, essentially. And this is where some of the power of quantum computers might come. But it's also the Achilles heel, the weak spot, because the flip side of having this, being able to store vast amounts of information in quantum superpositions is that those superpositions are very, very fragile. And there's a great sensitivity to uh, terms in the Hamiltonian that theorists don't like to think about, but experimentalists face every day. And in particular, the phase of quantum superpositions is uh, well defined only for a finite coherence time, which in nuclear magnetic resonance language is called T2. And for example, you might have a uh, very simple Hamiltonian for your qubit. It's just two levels, and it has a transition frequency omega naught to go from here to here. That's the, like the Zeeman frequency for a spin. And there might be noise in the circuit parameters or whatever that's causing the transition frequency to wander up and down in some random way. And when you solve the Schrodinger equation, you know, there's these phase factors associated with the energy levels. And the relative phase of the superposition, I don't care about the fact that omega naught might be 2 pi times 6 gigahertz. That's no, I can keep track of 6 billion rotations per second of the spin with good clocks. That's not, not a problem for the experimentalist. Um, but if there's some uh, extra phase rotation diffusion due to this noise, uh, I'd, and I don't know what it is, I lose track of the uh, phase of the superposition, and that's an error. And if this frequency noise is white, that is the frequency is just dithering around like this, uh, which, which it does in some approximation, then this integral of the accumulated phase is a random walk. I take a little step in phase dt delta omega, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, and I random walk a distance which goes like square root of time. And if I calculate the expectation value of this relative phase, the exponential, if phi is Gaussian distributed, then it's exactly given by the exponential of the second moment. And if phi is growing like square root of time because of phase diffusion, then phi squared is growing linearly in time. And I get exactly exponential decay of the phase coherence on a time scale called T phi which is given by one over one half of the, the spectral density of the frequency noise, which has units, by the way, of hertz squared per hertz. So you should think about that for a while. Uh, so in NMR language, this phase coherence time is one over T2, has a contribution, one over T5, from this pure dephasing, the frequency noise, it also has a contribution from the fact that there might be um, uh, decay of the excited state to the ground state, you know, like by spontaneous emission of a photon or something. And that, of course, will also destroy the face, the, sup the superposition, because it'll put you just in the ground state. And that comes with a factor of one half, because 1 over T1 is the rate of the energy decaying. And the phase coherence is an amplitude, and turns out there's a half there. So that's an example of an error. Uh, but despite this great sensitivity, and things looked very bad in 1999 when the first uh, superconducting qubit was built by Nakamura in Japan, the phase coherence time was immeasurably small. I mean, probably a nanosecond. <laughs> Uh, but by uh, clever experimental design, you can't really get rid of a lot of these noise sources. It's just uh, 1 over F noise. It's all kinds of junk noise. But by clever engineering and qubit design, we've made qubits that are insensitive to certain the types of noise that exist in these systems. And here's a plot from 
that's sort of Yale-centric and one that's MIT-centric, and it's basically the same data. And you can see that coherence times have risen six orders of magnitude uh, since uh, people initially laughed at the idea that superconducting qubits could make a quantum computer. So there's been tremendous exponential uh, progress, and it may well continue. Yes? Can you, um, or maybe you were going to plan to do this anyway, say what a superconducting qubit is? Um, so I'll talk about that in the second lecture. Okay. Uh, but nothing I'm going to say today is particular to uh, uh, superconducting qubits. But a superconducting qubit is a, a circuit containing a Josen junction element, which acts like an artificial atom and has quantized energy levels. And you can use it as a, as a qubit. Um, the one I'm going to talk about tomorrow is actually using microwave photons as the qubits, and what you people think of as the superconducting qubits is just the thing to manipulate those. Uh, so this is just an example of one technology and how things have gotten exponentially better. Uh, but, and it may well keep getting exponentially better, but despite that, I need to introduce you to an important uh, law of physics, which I modestly call Gervin's Law. <laughs> which is, there's no such thing as too much coherence. <laughs> so, you know, if I build a quantum computer and it can run for one second, one of you is going to say, yeah, but I have a harder problem and I need to run it for two seconds, please. So there's never, the, the demand for coherence is insatiable, right? Same thing in atomic <laughs> clocks and so forth. So there's no such thing. All right, so that means we need quantum error correction. All right, so here's the quantum error correction problem stated in a nutshell, and then we're going to spend the rest of this lecture and the next lecture going into uh, details. So I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state. I'm going to give you, let's say, a spin a half pointing somewhere in the Bloch sphere, and I'm not going to tell you where it's pointing on the Bloch sphere. I'm not going to tell you the superposition that it's in. If you measure it, you're going to get that back action effect that I told you about. It's going to change the state and ruin it. It's going to collapse the state. If you happen to know what the state is, you could choose the correct measurement axis, and you would confirm that the state is what Alice said it was. But Alice is not telling you what it is. <clears throat> I want you to... Uh, if it develops an error, fix it without knowing what it is. Not so easy. But amazingly, it can be done. And the discovery uh, by Shore and by Steen that, that you could do quantum error correction, that you could use that to maybe build a nearly perfect quantum computer out of imperfect parts, is much more amazing and astounding than the idea that you can use a quantum computer and entanglement and, and superposition to do things that are exponentially faster than on a classical computer. That's amazing. But error correction is that you can do that is much more amazing, I think. <clears throat> OK. So um, how, how, does it, how does it work? Well. You're going to have to take the quantum information from Alice, let's say, and store it in what's called a logical qubit, some collection of n physical qubits. In this case, I'm showing nine. And you're going to have to put it in, the, there's uh, <coughs> two to the nine state basis states in the Hilbert space here. You're going to have to store that quantum information in a some subset of those states in some clever way that involves uh, a quantum, non-classical correlations, entanglement among these physical qubits in such a way that no single one of the physical qubits can know 
what the information is that's been stored. Why is that? Well, because the environment, uh, de the decoherence and, and errors can be viewed as this guy becoming, one of these becoming entangled with the environment, or equivalently, it turns out, the environment making a measurement of some kind on one of these qubits. So we want to want to develop a code which will protect against the case that, let's say, one of these qubits develops an error. If all nine develop an error, you know, there's no such thing as perfect <coughs> error correction uh, that where the information lives forever. A lot of people think that's the case, but it's not true. But for uh, if the error rate is low enough, maybe only one of these will develop an error. And so I need to, that if the environment measures this state of this guy and collapses it and knows what the state is, the environment has to learn nothing about what the logical qubit state is. Because otherwise, the logical qubit state will be collapsing. So the information has to be stored and kind of non-locally in this system, in some magic way. Then I need a max, and you know there might or might not have been an error. There's some entropy associated with that probabilistic situation. We need a Maxwell demon also made out of real parts by real experimentalists, not necessarily perfect, that can figure out a way to pump that entropy out of the logical qubit into some cold bath, dump it away, and restore this logical qubit to its original state so that it can wait, you know, so that it's ready for, to, to survive a little longer and wait for another error to occur. Okay, so that's the, now we just have to fill in a few details. <laughs> okay, so now the first thing to understand is in order to hide the information, I need some number n of physical qubits to kind of spread the information out so that no one of them knows what the information is. And I'll, I'll exp you'll, you'll see more details later, but right now you need to understand the cartoon. So if I imagine the errors on each qubit are independent, which is not necessarily true, uh, then right away I've made the problem much, much worse because the error rate is now nine times or n times faster because I have n physical qubits, right? And the Maxwell demon has to be so fast and so efficient and so low in its own error rate that it can pump the entropy and the errors out of there and do a very good job. And if it does a very good job, it will recover that factor of n and you will have made things no worse than before. That's called reaching the break-even point. And there's a vast literature, including experiments, on quantum error correction. And uh, they don't usually advertise the fact that they made things worse instead of better. But until the experiment that I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow, they all did. OK? So it's a real challenge to. Uh, build a Maxwell demon out of imperfect parts and have the whole thing work better than just using the best single one of the physical qubits that you have in your toolbox. And it's a kind of emergent collective phenomenon. Suppose this is the best single physical qubit. Suppose it has a coherence time of 100 microseconds. Well, if it's the best, then by definition, the other eight are worse. And I'm going to take my one best, and I'm going to add n minus one worse ones, and I'm going to get something better by uh, clever 
choice of my Maxwell demon. Okay? And for purposes of discussion, I'm going to presume the Maxwell demon is perfect and doesn't make mistakes. But when you actually calculate, uh, you know, how well you're going to do, you have to take into account the fact that there are quantum things in here, there are moving parts in here, and they can have errors also. That makes the problem even harder. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with classical, not quantum, and let's start with error heralding, not correction. That is, I want a flag to go up and says, oh, I'm not feeling well, I think I made a mistake, but I, you don't, you're not able to fix it. That's a simpler problem. Okay, so let's use a classical duplication code where a zero is represented by two physical bits both in the zero state and a one is, a logical one is represented by two physical qubits in the one state. So this is, uh, in that collection of nine I showed before, now I only have two. And the flag will go up if the two bits don't match. If I get uh, one of them flips, Remember, the only classical error really is bit flip. Um, uh, if, the, if one of them flips, then they won't match, and the flag will go up saying there was an error. So the, what kind of errors can we have? Well, we could have no error, and that if a single error occurs with probability p, then the probability of no error is 1 minus p squared, <laughs> And I can correctly herald that no error occurred because I see that they match. I can have a bit flip on the second qubit. That'll occur with probability 1 minus p, p. And I can herald that because I see, oh, 1 is 1 and the other 0. That's a mistake. Same thing if the bit flip is on the first. But in the, if p is a small probability, there's a small squared probability, p squared, that I'm going to actually get two errors. That's a problem because uh, if they both flip, they're both one, and the flag says, oh, everything's fine. There was no error. I didn't write, you know, there's other states where the input is one, one, and you think it's that one. Okay? So two errors are. Uh, We'll, call this to, we'll cause this to fail. Okay, so what are the good, goods and bads here? Well, I have to double the number of bits, so if I'm sending them you know, over a transmission channel, I'm going to lower my bandwidth by a factor of two. It's going to take twice as long to send the message. That's bad. The fidelity is going to go down from 1 minus p to 1 minus p squared. That is, um, the error rate is going to double because each bit has a chance to have an error. So if you expand this, it's 1 minus 2p. The, the leading error probability is now 2p. On the other hand, uh, I am able to herald those errors, and the only one that can't be heralded is, um, uh, has probability p squared instead of an unheralded error of p when I didn't use the duplication code. There's just a probability p, there's an error, and it's not heralded because I don't have any way of knowing with a single bit that there was an error. Okay? All right, so now let's try to do a quantum duplication code. And we stumble into the no cloning theorem, which says you can't do that. What is the no cloning theorem? It says, if I give you an unknown quantum state and, I, and you have a bit in the ground state, let's say, some, some known state, there does not exist a unitary U which will make a copy, will copy the information in this state and put it in that bit. Why is that? Well, if you look at the final state and expand it out, it has coefficients like alpha squared, down, down, beta squared, up, up, 
alpha, beta, right? But uh, quantum mechanics is linear. This is just a unitary matrix. The matrix cannot know the values of alpha and beta. It can't have any numbers inside it that know alpha and beta because that's an unknown state. So the right-hand side needs to be linear in alpha and beta. And if you clone the state, it's not linear in alpha and beta. It's a very, very simple fact, which is still <laughs> uh, kind of... Uh, what could have been understood in 1927, wasn't understood until 19, I forget, 87 or somewhere around there. Um, so I can't duplicate, I can't make copies of quantum information, which is very useful for um, encryption purposes, it turns out. Very bad if you're in the quantum Xerox business. So instead of cloning <coughs> or, or making a copy of the state in our ancilla, let's entangle the ancilla with the first bit that's holding the information. So then I have alpha down, down, and beta up, up. And how would I make, it's linear in alpha and beta, and there is a unitary which will do that, and the name of the unitary that does that is the controlled not gate. And there's a sort of standard circuit uh, schematic diagram for representing that. And the, um, it's a two qubit gate. And it says, uh, take the control bit. And if it's up, flip the target bit from up to down or down to up. Well, the target bit, the ancilla, is down. For this part of the wave function, the control knot does nothing. And I end up with where I started, alpha down, down. But for this part of the wave function, the control knot gate flips this up and makes that. So this gate, quantum gate, classical gates, you know, do stuff and, or, if, but quantum gates <coughs> do and don't act, right, at the same time. They act correctly on superpositions, and they do a superposition of flipping and not flipping the target, which is weird if you think about it. Okay? So maybe I can use this as a quantum version of the duplication code, even though it's an entangled state rather than a duplication of the state. Okay? Another way to say the no cloning theorem is to clone an unknown state, you have to measure what it is and then reproduce it. But when you measure it, you change it, and therefore you can't reproduce it. Questions? OK. <clears throat> so uh, we're, not we're still not trying to correct errors. We're just trying to do the analog of the classical heralding of errors. So suppose I have my Pauli matrices Z1 and Z2, <clears throat> which can be plus or minus 1. And uh, so Z1 on up is plus 1, and Z1 on down is minus 1. <clears throat> And suppose I had a way of measuring the joint parity operator, which is the product of Z1 and Z2. Then if <coughs> the bits are the same, I'm going to get plus 1 times plus 1, or minus 1 times minus 1. They're both going to give plus 1. So my code words, the, the up, up, and down, down, are eigenstates of the joint parity with eigenvalue plus one. And the error words, where the bits disagree, are eigenstates with eigenvalue minus one. So if I measure the joint parity and I get plus one, <coughs> I learn that there was no error. But I don't learn what the coefficients 
of down, down, and up, up were, because any superposition of this is still an eigenstate of the joint parity. I just get plus one, and the alpha and beta are protected. That's my quantum information. Nothing, nothing collapsed. If I get minus one, then I know I've heralded that there was a flip of a single bit, but I don't know which one. So I can't correct it. Okay. I can get to up down by having both up and flipping that, or having both down and flipping the, the other one. So I don't know which one happened. But at least, you know, I know to stop the calculation because it's gone wrong. And it turns out, actually, there's very clever algorithms when you have heralded errors, called erasure errors, uh, which <coughs> uh, can tolerate actually rather high rate of such errors and still fix them by some other layer of encoding on top of this. But I, I won't go into that. <coughs> okay. So the problem is, for the experimentalists, it's not so easy to measure the product of two operators without accidentally sort of measuring the individual operators, at least partly. I could, I could calculate the joint parity by measuring this and measuring that and multiplying the results. But I would have gained way too much information. Not only would I know the joint parity, I'd know the individual values of z. So the state would have collapsed to definitely the first one is up and the second one is down, say. Or they're both up. Well, that gets rid of the case where they were both down, and that's where my, the superposition of those is where my information was stored. So in quantum mechanics, it's very, very important what you, questions you don't ask, what you don't learn in a measurement, because the less you learn, the less bad back action there is on the system. Okay. And the reason this is hard experimentally is if these were like magnetic moments, a natural thing is to measure the total magnetic moment. It's not natural to measure the product. Um, basically, this operator treats this state and that state as the same, and they're very different because one, they have their moments this way and the other has moments this way. So it's not so easy. But if you have friends who are very good experimentalists, they can do that for you. <coughs> okay, so let's do an example. Uh, Alice gives you this unknown state, doesn't tell you what alpha and beta are. And uh, you try to leave it alone, but your apparatus accidentally carries out a rotation around the x-axis. There's a moment, if these are spins, there's a momentary magnetic field in the x-direction or something, and it causes this rotation. So now the state, uh, this is a coherent error. It's a unitary acting on the state. There's no entanglement involved. And it's weird. It's a coherent superposition of no error and an error, a bit flip error. So, so your quantum error correction algorithms have to work on superposition, not just correct errors if they happened, but correct situations where there's a coherent possibility that there was no error and there was an error. So, if, I'm, uh, if I now measure with my Z1, Z2, I will, do, because it uh, anti commutes with this, uh, I'll be able to tell that the, uh, the joint parity has changed sign. I'll be able to tell there's an error. And that occurs with probability sine squared theta over 2. And if it does occur, uh, uh, okay, I'm doing the wrong example. If, it, if there's no, if I measure the joint parity and it's plus one, then uh, that occurs with probability cosine squared theta over two. And the state collapses to psi. 
to the original state that you wanted. So a continuous error has occurred by some rotation theta. You have measured whether an error occurred and you found no error. And there's a deep theorem of quantum mechanics that if there is no error, there is no error. By, by, by the act of looking to see whether there was an error, you made it go away. It's a Zeno effect. On the other hand, suppose you looked, and with probability psi squared theta over 2, you found that the parity was minus 1. Then the state collapses to this, which has not a little error uh, associated with a, some small value of theta. It has a full bit flip error. On the other hand, you, you know it, uh, you can't correct it because you don't know which bit flipped, but uh, you, at least you know there's an error. It doesn't occur very often for small theta, but when it does, you get a full error. So um, errors are sort of continuous, but measured errors, errors heralded by measuring an error syndrome, in this case, Z, the joint parity, Z1, Z2, Z1, Z2 has discrete eigenvalues, plus 1 and minus 1. So you either get no error or full error. Those are the measured errors are discrete. And that's sort of the secret reason why quantum error correction can be made to work. So quantum errors are continuous. They're analog. But the detector result is discrete. The measured errors are discrete, either a full bit flip or no bit flip. OK. So now we want to uh, do better than just herald errors. We want to actually correct them. And <clears throat> I'm going to spend some time later talking about how many different kinds of errors there are. But one kind of error is this bit flip that I've been talking about. So let's just stick to that. So suppose I have a three qubit, three qubits, which I entangle with my, I mean, I have two ancillas, and I entangle it with the qubit holding the information, and I have a sort of triplication code. It's usually called duplication, just in abusive language. But, and I have now um, different parities I can measure, z1 times z2. Uh, Z2 times Z3. I could also measure Z1 times Z3, but that's just the product of, of these two, so there's no extra information there. <laughs> so remember, each time I measure uh, an quantum operator that has two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one, I get exactly one classical bit of information. I have two such operators. So my measurements are going to give me two classical bits of information. That's enough to resolve four possibilities. And the four possibilities are there was no error, there was a bit flip on the first error or of qubit, or the second qubit, or the third qubit. I will get fooled if there are two bit flips or three bit flips. Uh, but if the errors are uh, small, probability, the most likely thing is no error. The next most likely thing is one error. And having two errors that will fool you is, is hopefully quite unlikely. All right? So this code can correct only one type of error, which is bit flip. There are others in quantum. That's the only one classically, but there are others quantum mechanically, like phase flip. Um, and I have just enough information to figure out whether there was an error, and if so, which bit got flipped. So I look, it's just majority rule. If, if these two, I can tell whether from these two being the same or different, and those two being the same or different, which one is different if it's only one. And that's the one that had a bit flip, and I just flip it back. That's the algorithm.
Okay. So um, there are many uh, error correcting codes, including some that involve topology, like the uh, Kataev Toric code. Uh, and if you extend these to five, seven, nine, or more qubit codes, you can correct uh, any kind of error. And um, one possibility is no error. One possibility is a single bit flip on one of the n qubits. A single phase flip on one of the n qubits. Or a single y error, which is basically x times z. So it's both a bit flip and a phase flip. It has no classical. Th these two have no classical analog. It turns out that five is the smallest number of physical qubits you can use to make a logical qubit, which will correct all errors. The three I showed you only corrected uh, bit flip. But if I have five, there are two to, two to the five is 32. Uh, and there are, uh, there's one way there can be no error. There's five ways there can be a bit flip, five ways a z, five ways a y. So there are 16 possible error states. And I have 32 states in my system. So that's just enough room to encode, when I make measurements of certain error syndromes, uh, enough bits to, um, uh, I need four bits to figure out the error state. And I have uh, two states left over to still hold the quantum information. So five turns out to be the smallest logical qubit, but it's sufficiently small that uh, it's very hard to work with. It's very hard to do logical uh, rotations on the logical block sphere, which involve five qubit uh, multi-qubit operations. You basically have to decode the information, do the rotation, and encode it back. And then while, you, while you're decoded, you're not protected. OK, so that's like the cartoon story. Y yes? Is there a different kind of error where something gets decoded like you showed in your first picture with the nine things, and then one of them would get decoded as opposed to getting flipped but staying pure? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the nine that I showed you could be, for example, the so-called Shore code, which is the bottom row is uh, this triplication code that fixes um, bit flip errors and makes a, a little logical qubit of three that, that you can fix bit flip errors. Then you do a triplication of that three times, which will correct phase flip errors. And it turns out will also correct y errors. So you can you can have a, a bit flip uh, or a phase, a decoherence of a phase. That that thing with the phase wandering around, that's just a random application of z. Because the z changes the relative phase of the superposition. So it will correct that. It'll also correct um, coherent superpositions of errors such as x minus i y, which is sigma minus. That it's not unitary. It falls, drives you down from the excited state to the ground state, but doesn't go the other way. It will also fix that. So it will fix any possible single quantum error if you have that nine qubit code. And the smallest code that'll do that is with five, but I didn't show you what the code was. Does that help? So if I have a random frequency of my transition and the phase is wandering, in terms of the logical operation, that's like applying a z at random every once in a while, which gives you a full minus sign instead of just, uh, it gives you a pi error in the phase instead of some continuously varying error. But in some, again, in the spirit that you think errors are, um, analog, but when you measure them, they're discrete. And a randomly occurring phase error of, my, of pi correctly uh, simulates what's really going on, at least after the measurement's over. Are, are weak measurements ever used in error correction? Now you're talking only about 
measurements yeah. today. Yes, so I'm going to only talk about like projective measurements of these error syndromes. There's a whole nother story. Uh, weak measurements is a um, loaded term, which uh, uh, it, uh, there's a whole thing called weak measurements, which is what I'm not, not talking about. But sort of continuous measurements where you're slowly gathering information and uh, doing feedback, or even autonomous uh, servo systems that are quantum, which just spontaneously correct the errors automatically. The, those also um, uh, work. So you can have, a, you can have a, a weak measurement in the sense that you learn a little bit of information about whether the parity, joint parity is even or odd, and you make a slight change in the state, but not fully, and you, you, you just keep feeding back and feeding back, and it will spontaneously uh, fix the errors while you without ever sending any information up to room temperature for you to make a decision on your computer about whether there was an error and flip it. That's a whole nother scheme. It's sort of, it's not, it, it's physically different, but in terms of where the information's going and stuff, it's really kind of the same thing. But I'm only, I'm only gonna talk about the case where uh, I send information up to room temperature from a strong, projective measurement that tells me, yes, there was an error, or no, there wasn't an error. And then I have a computer make a decision and go back and make a correction. But th that's not the only uh, way of doing things. Yeah. Good question. All right. So um, I probably won't get through all of the mathematical details, but uh, so uh, Shannon talked about channels, classical channels for transmitting information. You can think of this as a tra um, uh, transmitting from Alice to Bob in space, or Alice transmitting to herself in time by storing the bits and waiting, and then the channel is the error process that's happening while your system is sitting there, hopefully doing nothing, but in fact, things might be happening. And classically, uh, there's only one kind of error. You can confuse a one with a zero and a zero with a one. And it need not be symmetric. Uh, you just need the sum of the probabilities to be one. Although if these are equal, that's called a symmetric binary channel. And then there's only one error, which is bit flip, classically. So, uh, well, what we'd like to have in a quantum channel so quantum channel is like the most general thing that can happen to a quantum system. And uh, I'm going to illustrate with some examples. So what you'd really like is a noiseless, uh, the identity channel, right? You'd like nothing to happen. But maybe, maybe there's some unitary that gets applied. Like if, if this is a channel for a single bit, maybe there's a rotation around some axis. And by calibration, you could figure out what that is if it was the same every time, and then you could undo it at the other end. That's not really a problem. I'd be happy to have that situation, okay? That's one possible channel. Uh, and you can think of that as a coherent superposition of four possible errors, identity, bit flip, phase flip, and both by expanding that exponential. Um, but maybe you have a noisy channel. Maybe inside there is a, somebody who's tossing a coin and based on what the coin flip does, deciding to apply a random uh, uh, unitary. Maybe the coin, it's a dice and it, has, uh, it can come up one through six and you have six possible unitaries, and every time the dice comes up three, the demon applies unitary number three. But you don't know which one got applied, so now there's some actual randomness and some entropy getting generated. And um, uh, so that means that your output is actually a density matrix, 
density matrix is, contains all the information you need to predict the results of measurements on the quantum state. Um, and it's not, uh, okay, it's controversial, but my personal view is it's very clear that this is a statement about your knowledge of the state, not about what the state really is. And as long as the probabilities add up to one, the trace, the density matrix will still be one. And as long as we're dealing with density matrices, we might as well have um, uh, a density matrix in the input. So typically quantum channels talk about uh, transforming one density matrix into another one. So the input density matrix is the set of all possible messages? Uh, for example, you, yes, uh, you, you could, um, you, uh, Alice could be sending a message from, an, from, an, from a set of messages and you don't know which one she sent, then your knowledge of what's going in there is a, can only be described by a density matrix. That's right. Or, you know, you could have a quantum bit and it's had some errors happening to it, and now I'm going to study some more errors that happened to it. That, then you should have density matrix going to density matrix. Exactly. Right. So and you want to preserve it. Exactly. So, the right. So the whole Yep. Exactly. So even if the computer's perfect and you were, you could describe what's happening to the whole computer with a big unitary, if you're only interested in what's happening to um, one of the bits you have to assume that it's, you can't make any special assumptions that it's not entangled with other stuff. And so, uh, but when you trace out that other stuff, of course, then this guy appears to be in a density matrix. Thank you, that's good. Um, okay, so typically the entropy goes up when you're not sure which unitary got applied. And one, a sort of standard quantum channel to think about is the so-called depolarizing channel. Um, and that is that, that the, you know, every density matrix can be described by um, a point on the block sphere that might be in the interior instead of on the surface. And when you get to the origin, it's just uh, uh, the completely mixed uh, state, the density matrix is an identity matrix. Um, so the depolarizing channel does the following. Uh, it, you, it toss a coin, and with probability epsilon over 4, you apply x or y or z. And with the remaining probability, you do nothing. So it's, it's uh, completely isotropic in spin space. It, the errors in x and y and z are all occur with equal frequency. And so you can show, here's a little homework exercise to do during the coffee break, that this uh, uh, set of random unitaries does the following. It takes the uh, input uh, density matrix and with probability 1 minus epsilon leaves it alone, does nothing. And with probability epsilon turns it into the infinite temperature mixed state, one half, one half, zero, zero. Okay? So that's a standard channel that uh, computer scientists like because they don't want to think about the fact that error correction, errors are physics and error correction is actually a physics problem. And typically, uh, er uh, this has a huge amount of symmetry. Typically, one kind of error actually dominates over other kinds and you should design your error correction schemes to take that into account. But computer scientists tend to skip that part. So they use this so-called depolarizing channel as their error model. Okay, well you might think if I just had a b enough unitaries and applied them randomly, that would be like the most general thing that could happen to a quantum system. Uh, but that's not true. 
uh, and th these, these are always unital. They map the, if you have an identity uh, fully mixed state here, you always get a fully mixed state out uh, because the unitaries pass through the identity. Um, so that's not, uh, that's not what you want. That's not general enough. And that David alluded to what's the most general thing, which is I have my system and then I have some thing which might be the environment. It might be just a set of ancilla bits that I want to use for some purpose. And I do a giant unitary on the whole expanded Hilbert space. And then I throw away these guys, some bit dump, and I, I, I have left some new density matrix for my system. So here's, and uh, I'm going to, so it might, if this were really a physical bath that I don't have control over, possibly my system would be entangled with it at the start, but I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm, for purposes of defining a channel, I'm going to take that they're uh, unentangled at the start, apply a unitary to the whole thing, trace out the environment, and you can show that what's left always looks like this. And this is called the Krauss representation, 1s, I think. And it's a sum of uh, up to d squared terms, where d is the dimension uh, of uh, the system Hilbert space, of some operator, ek, and ek dagger. And it looks a little bit like what we had before with the random unitaries, except that the e's are not unitary. The only requirement you have is a completeness relation that they should, their e dagger e should add up to the identity so that probability is conserved. So this is an example of a what, CPTP, completely positive trace preserving map. And that's the most general thing you can do to map one density matrix into another. Density matrices have to have trace one because, uh, well, if you diagonalize them, the entries are kind of probabilities. They have to be between zero and one. They have to be non-negative and they have to add up to one. So uh, by, by this requirement, you can show that the trace of this is one. And uh, it's not, a, again, a homework exercise to show that any uh, form like this, if this is positive, uh, when you apply these cross operators, it remains a positive matrix. It's a little bit, you know, uh, it's a little bit like multiplying by a number and it's complex conjugate, so it should be it's just a real factor, but it, the proof is slightly more complicated than that, but it's not very hard. Okay. And there's, if you're interested in uh, the fact that you can synthesize this channel, you may, here you need at least d squared states in your environment to do the most general thing. But we showed in this paper that you could have one two-level qubit and just repeat this many times, making measurements on the qubit and doing subsequent operations conditioned on those measurement results. You could synthesize any quantum channel of any dimension with one, cub one qubit in the environment. No, it's, uh, that's, uh, there's actually, because it's adaptive, uh, there, it's a, a log as many as you think you needed. <coughs> okay. Uh, now, another interesting thing, so this is the most general thing that can happen to a density matrix, and this could represent stuff I'm doing on purpose in my quantum computer. It could represent stuff the environment is doing and causing errors in my computer. So this is going to be like the error channel. Or I could be sending, Alice could be sending Bob information through uh, photons stored in, a, in uh, going through a telecom fiber and things could be happening. Absorption, polarization, rotation, and so forth. 
and uh, this can represent all of this can represent everything. It's the most general thing that can happen. It's not unique. I, a couple slides back, I gave a, an expression for this based on what the giant unitary is. I guess I didn't point that out. Uh, but it's not unique. You, let's say these are errors. This is like the kth error happened. Well, it turns out you can take coherent superpositions of the errors. You can take any unitary rotation among the error set by this matrix SKM, and you can show that if you do that and put K, this K here instead of E, you get the same answer. So there's not a unique representation uh, you can have. So if you have x errors, sigma x and sigma y errors, you could change the representation to be x plus iy and x minus iy, that is, jumps up and down, uh, and uh, with the right coefficients, you'd still get the same answer. Okay, so we showed like random unitaries, and, you know, those, t and in general, right, you're used to thinking about entanglement, you get entangled with something, the whole universe has zero entropy, but the piece of it you're looking at has finite entropy, the entanglement entropy, that's what Duncan's talk was about. But uh, arbitrary channel can decrease entropy, if you want. An example, which we use all the time, is the reset channel. The reset channel has Krauss operators that take every state in your system and maps it to the ground state, to the, some particular state, let's say the ground state. And if you... Um, if you check, I mean, you can check that this uh, obeys the completeness relation and so forth. So, you know, uh, I just want to refrigerate my system and get it in the ground state. Experimentalists can do that, and uh, so theorists had better be able to say they can do it. Okay, so if a quantum channel is the most general thing that can happen to a quantum system, and if quantum error correction is possible, it too must be a quantum channel. So if this is the error map, the things that happen to your system, and if it's possible to do error correction, there should be a recovery map and it should have that form. And it should take you back from your error state to your original state. It's not always true. I mean, I showed you a duplication code where you could herald the error, but you couldn't fix it. But if you've arranged your system cleverly enough, and you have a specified set of errors you claim it can recover from, then, and it's true, then there exists a map like this that will let you recover. And it's a quantum channel. Uh, okay, so, um, I will, there is a well-defined condition for the properties of the errors that will tell you whether this recovery map exists, and I'll start with that, uh, it, the Knill laflamme conditions in my next lecture, and I'll allow a few minutes for questions now. Thank you. <laughs>